Thank you all. On uh, behalf of Pops and Matt, we really are appreciating you all having us today. Um, so we just want to uh, open up with talking a little bit about New York Creates. Uh, I'm the Chief Operating Officer for New York Creates. Creates stands for the Center for Research, Economic Advancement, Technology, Engineering, and Sciences. Uh, we really, uh, we're a New York-based 501c3 nonprofit that focuses on uh, growing research and economic advancement in the, the state of New York. Uh, this is some of the footprint that we actually are working with today, and we're also looking to continue to grow this. Uh, just because of the, the, the way it is on this screen, I'm going to go from uh, the, the left all the way to the right. Uh, we're going to start with, with Dunkirk, which is uh, just south of Buffalo. It, we have a high-tech uh, pharma, pharmaceutical oncology uh, organization called Athenex that we're working with, and they create a uh, pharma. I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. They create. Yep, yeah, thank you. They create a, a drug mix that will uh, be used by many of the the upcoming firms to to work on oncology and cancer related uh, 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 technologies. Uh, in the Buffalo area itself, we have a number of locations, including the uh, Tesla Gigafactory that focuses on uh, the rooftop shingle. So it's more of the solar side uh, of Tesla that is embedding solar panels into roof shingles. Uh, and actually here in California, they have a larger majority of, of the, the roofs that uh, Tesla makes are being embedded today along with, uh, again, Athenex, one of our partners, which was a spinoff from the University of Buffalo and the Kaleida Health uh, Organization. So they have their, their medical center there. Uh, and then Curia, which is formerly known as AMRI, also has a uh, incubator there for their drug delivery systems. And as we keep going north, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the Rochester area. New York Creates is uh, the overseer of one of the federal manufacturing institutes. Uh, AIM Photonics is, is uh, one of those institutes that focuses on embedding lasers into silicon chips to uh, bring light uh, into the processing to move faster. And, and this Rochester facility is our test assembly package area, which I'll go into a little bit more. Uh, going out all the way to the right still is in our uh, Syracuse area is a company called NextGen, focusing on power electronics using GAN on GAN. Uh, up north in the uh, New York State is in our Plattsburgh area, is our North Country uh, hub of innovation, which is a partnership with Norse Titanium. They're a 3D printing company. They use titanium rods in a 3D printing process to create aeronautical uh, parts uh, including uh, things for DOD and, and NASA. And then uh, in the middle area, we have some, we have two new partnerships. Uh, one of them is, uh, the most recent is an announcement that Wolfspeed, formerly Cree, moved uh, their silicon carbide processing from uh, North Carolina up to New York. And this is opening their world's first 200 millimeter uh, silicon carbide factory, which they will focus on the power electronics. Uh, next to that facility is also a partner of ours, uh, Danfoss Silicon Power, and they take uh, and package uh, chips for, for power devices. But our main facility that we do much of our research work is in Albany. It's the Albany Nanotech facility. It is the only uh, 300 millimeter research and development publicly owned site uh, in the US. Uh, it is one that we are very proud of and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But let me just talk to you a little bit about New York and the ecosystem uh, so, you, so we can better familiarize ourselves outside of what New York Creates does. New York has a very healthy semiconductor ecosystem. It's the third largest semiconductor ecosystem in the US. Uh, 88 semiconductor companies are currently established and we're continuing to grow those. That doesn't necessarily always include the, the startups um, and the, the small and medium sized businesses, but uh, that's a, a, a nice number. Uh, and uh, you know, between the 34,000 direct jobs, it also uh, approximately 
$3.5 billion of, of money that is annually uh, dispersed in wage, wages uh, throughout our semiconductor industry. So let me talk to you about the Albany Nanotech Complex. If you're not familiar with it, uh, it's in Albany, New York. It is the only publicly owned 300 millimeter research and development uh, organization uh, in, in the US. We really have very little comparators in the world. You start talking about IMEC, Letty, the Fraunhofer Institute as potential comparators at that point. We have over uh, uh, 152,000 square feet of space. 120,000 uh, of that is for direct clean room on waffle clean room. They're all class A 100, class 100 clean rooms. Uh, we have more than 2,700 people that work on the site on a daily basis. And we've had a number of successful uh, programs that have run through there today, uh, including the Global 450 program, the Center for Semiconductor Research, a AI hardware center, uh, Semitech, a materials engineering technology accelerator, otherwise known as META as well. Um, we really have a history of achieving a lot of things on this site, but most recently, IBM, who's one of our main partners on that site, announced that they developed the world's first two nanometer process chip. Uh, and that was uh, roughly about three months ago, they announced that that process happened in, uh, a at our site. Um, also, last year, IBM announced that the chip that they created on the site early on, roughly about 2018, is now being used in the fastest uh, server chip or server in the world. Uh, IBM has now reclaimed that from, uh, from uh, overseas. We also, in addition to the wafer side, which Albany is really our wafer processing, in Rochester, we have our test assembly package facility, which allows us to take the both front end and back end and combine that. It's a 12,000 square foot facility uh, with really wafer and chip scale testing as well as the packaging component. Uh, this is also a, a main part of our AIM Photonics program, our National Manufacturing Institute. As a nonprofit research organization, we're also very proud of the workforce development uh, partnerships that we have. We obviously, being a state organization, are very connected to uh, the state university, which is the world's largest uh, state university, comprehensive state university. Uh, we also have a number of partnerships with significant uh, private schools, including uh, Cornell, Columbia, Clarkson, uh, RIT, U of R, um, RPI, etc. Uh, there's a, a, you know, the myriad of, of jobs that we work with them on are not just your traditional engineering and, and uh, technology related jobs. We're also working with them on creating a core uh, infrastructure for an entire pipeline that supports fabs and also the organizations that support uh, those fabs going forward. And that includes not just uh, you know, your regular jobs, it includes your, tra your trades, uh, your electricians, your HVACs, your ultra pure water uh, and construction organizations that help will drive the, the uh, portfolio and, and, um, and job uh, line going forward. So what are currently uh, R&D capabilities? Obviously here, uh, quantum is one of the things we wanna really talk about today uh, between our partnership with Seek and the work that POPS is doing. We'll highlight that in a minute. But we also focus on deamorphic computing, uh, integrated photonics, obviously with our AIM uh, nationwide footprint there. Uh, Emron technology, power electronics, nano bio devices, uh, heterogeneous integration and advanced processing. Some of the main partners we have to date are uh, IBM, Tell, Applied Materials, Cree, Wolfspeed, uh, the AIM Photonics uh, membership, which is a, a large consortium, uh, Danfoss, NextGen. Uh, but we also want to very much highlight some of our quantum uh, partners, um, and including, you know, as I, I close up, I want to transfer this over to, to Matt from Seek to really talk about, you know, some of the partnerships we have and why it's important that, you know, us as a nonprofit and an academic organization partner with these companies to help grow that, that infrastructure. So with that said, I'm going to turn this over to Matt and we'll get him going. Thanks, Paul. 
Cheers. All right, hello everyone. So yeah, um, I'm Matt uh, from, from Seek, um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we do at, at Seek, um, and then also what we're working with, um, with Pops and his team at NY Creates on doing, and I should take this off, yeah. Not still getting used to wearing them. Um, so, what is Seek? You know, before we dig into kind of like the details, I'd like to give a bit of an overview about, about who we are, where we came from, um, because we're not your, your conventional kind of startup. We, we spun out um, of a company called Hypris, who themselves spun out of IBM in the early 80s. Um, and they have become uh, and still are the world leaders in, in superconducting digital electronics um, and have some really fantastic um, kind of products in the, in the kind of government space. Um, and, and that's where our core relies. We, we've, you know, with that heritage, we have de de designed from, you know, core technology right through to, to productization of a full stack cryogenic platform and shipped it to, to customers. And these customers um, aren't having to have PhDs to run our systems. They're, they're um, you know, good engineering level systems. Um, so that's kind of where we came from. And, and, you know, that has the core of that is based on this single flux quantum technology, uh, which one of our co co, co um, founders Oleg Mukhanov um, actually in, co invented. Um, and it's this, this single flux quantum technology I'll give a few more details about that is the core of our, our kind of platform. And, and why, you know, what differentiates us from, from a lot of what others in this space are doing. Um, on a business level, we're also not building, you know, general purpose quantum computers, at least at this stage. The plan is ultimately to get there. Uh, but right now, we want to build the most efficient uh, resource wise. Uh, quantum computers, um, and for that we, we work very closely with end customers, um, and we've actually got a partnership with with Merck that we announced very recently uh, to deliver them a, a full stack quantum computing platform um, that is tailored towards some some uh, applications in the pharmaceutical sector. Um, so yeah, that's kind of cool stuff. We've also got a, a state of the art nine layer foundry. It's nowhere near as big as and why creates, of course, but it's a, it's a commercial grade foundry and it's it's the most advanced of its type, um, a, a nine layer superconducting process, um, and it's the only uh, commercial nine layer foundry in the in the US um, and probably the most advanced in the world. So yeah, we we spun out with Hypris with that asset, which has been incredible on day one to have a hundred million dollar um, foundry asset to to really accelerate our R and D in this area. Um, and, you know, we've got some incredible leaders in both the business world and uh, the technical level. So I mentioned Oleg Mukhanov, who's, who's a luminary in the field. And we've also got what, uh, John Levy, who I'll talk a little bit more about later on in the project. And then, you know, on the, on the investment side, we, are, we spun out to, to build commercial grade products. And with that, we wanted to raise some serious capital. Um, so we started off with some, some incredible investment by Blue Yard um, at our Series Seed. And they're a really uh, sophisticated quantum uh, technology investor. Um, and then more recently, we've, we've uh, closed a round of Series A with EQT. And they're you know, one of the top investors in Europe. Um, so we have some really incredible backing. And also, we've got, um, in, in line with that application specific, uh, strategy, um, we have partnered very closely with Merck and they also invested in us and the same is, is true with LG. So we really like to mix our investor community with both uh, conventional uh, financial investors and also uh, st more strategic aligned investors. So you've all been at this conference for three days now, so I don't need to labor on the point of quantum computing and, and why we think it's really cool. But I think what I want to do is present why, why we think it's cool, what we want to do in this space. Um, and so, so for us, you know, there's lots of applications out there, but I'd like to just highlight one critical one that we're working on, particularly with Merck. Um, and it's all around, you know, how, how kind of drug discovery development is done today. Um, and it's, it's based on this essentially wet lab in, in, in vivo, in vitro type uh, R&D. So that really is, you know, you're, you're in a lab and you're taking chemicals uh, and, and molecules and trying to work out if they, if they bond to active sites or not. Um, and it's very labor intensive and it's very time consuming and it ultimately uh, costs billions of dollars per drug. So on average, it's about $2.6 billion in the R&D phase. Um, and, and ultimately, uh, the critical issue is that, that uh, you know, as um, drug discovery gets more and more expensive, the return on investment is starting to wane. Um, and there's this real risk that, that ultimately 
um, drugs won't be developed anymore because they're not cost effective to do so. Um, and we were already starting to see like, the major pharmaceutical companies move away from drug discovery um, and move into kind of selling what they already have in their existing portfolio. Um, so we want to see if quantum computing can ultimately assist in this, this, this challenge. And, and that's where they could, the dream is to build a quantum computer powerful enough that it can ultimately take over the jobs of the wet lab, um, at least in the interim, start to support better the jobs of the wet labs. And it's all about you know, with a quantum computer, it's a naturally quantum system. So can we better simulate quantum mechanical elements um, and ultimately take over what's happening in the, in the chemical lab? Um, and with that, you know, that concept, we actually went and said, OK, let's go and get some money to do this. And, and we've got a government contract from the UK. We're also based in the UK um, to work with Merck and a, an incredible supply chain uh, sitting, sitting to work with us. Um, to essentially build this exact platform. So how do we build a, a quantum computer that's embedded in an existing large-scale HPC? Um, and we're working very carefully on how you integrate quantum computing with existing HPC infra infrastructure. Um, and also, we've got some incredible software development. And you know, a really exciting thing for me is in, in the kind of cryogenic side, we've got a, uh, one of the largest uh, cryostats that's being built um, is, is being given to us as part of this project. And then, and then we're having some custom work to, to really optimize for the system uh, I'll talk about now. So what are we doing in quantum computing and why are we a bit different? Um, so you know, we always like to start off with where classical computers was in the 1940s. Um, and, and you see this kind of room filling system uh, with lots of wires and ultimately lots of complexity. And this isn't the system that went on to become the commercial product. Um, it took the invention of the integrated circuit um, and the recognition that this wasn't a scalable system uh, to, to ultimately create the integrated circuit and then, and then build the computers that sit in, sit in, our, in our pockets these days. Um, and so, you know, if you fast forward to today, um, this is the most, one, of, one of the most advanced quantum computers on the planet. Um, it's the Google Sycamore system. Um, and there's been a, a handful of these now, and they're all incred incredible systems. Uh, but they, they don't look too dissimilar. You've got, you know, significantly, you know, lots of wires. Um, there's, there's 50 odd, 53 qubits sitting in here, and you've got, you know, tens of wires and hundreds of wires to, to, to mount the system up. And then you've got racks and racks of room temperature electronics. And the, the challenge is that these mo the most powerful quantum computers um, in the superconducting space have to uh, be maintained at extremely cold temperatures. Um, and all of the control is at room temperature. So this, this you know, the, the great thing about this is it works, it functions and it's full stack. So you can actually run algorithms on it. And this has a proof point that we can build quantum computers. This is incredible. But what we want to think about is how do you take this and turn it into the, the kind of scalable um, commercial grade systems that, that ultimately customers want to buy. Um, and so you know, what we want to do is, is remove a lot of this complexity. And that's what we've done with our, our SFQ technology in a series of, of, of digital chips that take a lot of that functionality, most of that room temperature functionality, a significant portion of those wires um, and convert it into on-ship integrated circuits. So rather than having you know, room temperature control, we have on-ship integrated circuits. And these, because they're SFQ based, they're single flux quantum based on a superconducting architecture, they naturally want to sit in the same temperature ranges as qubits. So we actually can integrate uh, this circuit with qubits uh, in a common integrated circuit. Uh, we do it in a multi-chip module way so it doesn't decohere the qubits. Um, and ultimately, this thing um, is the integrated circuit of the quantum era, in our opinion. Um, so it's, a, it's kind of the first chip, truly chip-based. You hear a lot about chip-based solutions, but those chips still need to be controlled by optics or, or lasers and things like this. This is the, the digital chip-based solution for quantum computing. So I'd like to talk about, you know, it's kind of an abstract concept. So let's build up what a quantum computer looks like in this format. Um, and you start with, you know, the important bits, the qubits. Um, but, but the critical thing is these are really unstable. They're really difficult to control. Um, so how do we start to stabilize and build a system around this? Um, and it starts with you know, our core layer, which is the SFQ, uh, low, lowest temperature SFQ processes. This is a unique technology. It's, uh, it's, been, it's been designed since, since we spun out that ultimately we can, we can co-locate the most energy efficient versions of our SFQ circuits and directly bump bond them uh, to uh, qubit technologies. And with this, what we're getting is essentially um, the lowest latency where we can stabilize the qubit performance. So um, in the nearest possible time, in the lowest possible latency, we can take the qubit, read them, read them out, and stabilize them and correct them. Um, and so you know, we're talking really tiny latencies. And, and this chip is clocked at 10 to 40 gigahertz. 
Um, so it operates extremely fast and faster than the qubits, which is kind of critical for, for this technology area. Um, and we've, we've got a, a whole firmware team that are building you know, how to take advantage of this kind of core layer. Um, and then the other kind of unique thing about our system is it can start to take advantage of other areas of the, of the, of the cooling power of a system. So, you know, you see these chandelier type um, computers from IBM and Google and, and they've got all these different temperature stages and lots of cooling power that's just going to waste. Essentially, it's not being utilized um, because they just want to get something as cold as physically possible. Uh, but our system, uh, we can take advantage of, of the, the 600 millicoven plate to put slightly more powerful uh, processors. This is where you get a little bit more cooling power because it's slightly hotter. Um, and we can put you know, some brunt there. And, and the cool stuff here, and we, we're, we're soon to announce and tape out uh, a unique uh, quantum error correction decoder. It's the first of its kind. It's truly chip-based quantum error correction decoder. Um, and that's going to be some really cool stuff to, to look out for. Uh, but this is where we kind of build, essentially, what, what, what are the support functions a quantum computer needs to do? How do we automate a lot of what the control uh, needs to do? Um, in these temperature stages. And then finally, we've got loads of cooling power at three Kelvin, so let's take advantage of that. Um, and we build uh, a, uh, more, the most powerful SFQ processor we can, which is, you know, we've got lots of power there, so we've got lots of junctions, um, and we integrate it with some, some cryo CMOS. So this is not cryo, our, our core technology is not cryo CMOS, it's superconducting, means it operates extremely fast, so it's, you know, 10 to 40 gigahertz. The fastest we've ever clocked a switch is 700 gigahertz. Um, so this is, you know, completely unique technology. And then some aspects where we've got a project and how you might integrate some level of CMOS into that. So yeah, that's kind of what we do. And it's all about, this whole system is about how do you stabilize qubits as quickly as possible, automate as much of the control so it's a commercial grade product, um, and ultimately reduce the latencies because these qubits operate extremely fast. Um, and so in order to take advantage of that speed, you need extremely fast logic and for extremely low latency logic. And that's what the system is designed to do. Um, and it's all built with this application in mind. What does the application need to design, to build this? And, and that's where we are. Um, so just before I get into kind of the work we're doing with, with Popson's team, um, just want to highlight you know, who we are from a, from a leadership point of view. You know, I, I've got a background in quantum computing hardware development, but that's, that's years ago now. Uh, but, but our CEO has got you know, decades of experience in, in running companies and is just an incredible mentor for me, actually, and, and just works, works tirelessly to make this stuff work and, and, and is, is you know, led our, all of our series rounds and, and is doing a great job. Um, and then Oleg, he's, you know, he's a kind of an expert in the field. He was, he was a bit of a bit of a incredible thing to be working with him, to be honest, from my point of view, when I, when I was a, a, an undergrad, um, he was a bit of a legend. Um, so now to, to have him join our company and, and run it is, is awesome. So what are we doing in, in the space with NY Create? So what we want to do is actually build, you know, how do we, how do we take commercial grade systems and platforms like this and build a commercial grade quantum processor to support that? Um, and it really is about how we go to a, you know, a commercial CMOS grade type uh, wafer line. It's a 300 millimeter process. Um, and you've heard a lot about this from you know, the, the, the likes of PsyQuantum, that this is kind of critical to scaling up these systems. Can we move to a 300 millimeter process? Um, and we want to do it with a, an advanced new type of qubit uh, that, that has some serious advantages from a commercial standpoint. Um, so, you know, Pops is going to give a lot more details now. I just want to give a highlight of what we're doing. Ultimately, the, the vision is to create this, this, this wafer scale, this 300 millimeter wafer scale line uh, with um, a higher, a, 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 this qubit based on a fluxonium, uh, which is ultimately shown to be much higher coherence than your, your current technologies, uh, your transmon type qubits, um, and is just a really nice qubit to work with. And we also want to work with some advanced materials that, that NY Creates can, can work, have some great expertise in. So how do we both improve the design of the qubits and also the functionality through the, the material choices? Um, and the goal is to get wafer scale greater than 100 microsecond kind of qubits on a 300 millimeter process, which would be incredible. Um, and we build this into our kind of core uh, platform. So this is the multi-chip module uh, that I talked about. You saw the slides from earlier. Um, on top is the qubit chip. Um, this is one of the first generations qubit chips we've got uh, from these guys. Um, and then we've got our control layer and you bump on them together. And we've done you know, lots of simulations and figured out this stuff works. And then the immediate next step is to start testing them uh, cryogenically. Um, so yeah, we want to finish on some goals. This is, this is it really. We want to build 300 millimeter wafer scale fluxoniums. Um, and this will be the world's first if, if we achieve it, which is incredible. Um, we also want to use the world's first kind of 
all tantalum based uh, qubits. So this is that unique kind of taking advantage of the material science uh, that these guys all know about to, to really, how do we get to better coherence qubits um, with better designs? And it would be the world's first uh, 300 millimeter wa uh, wafer scale fluxonium qubit array. So these are some pretty big, big goals and milestones we want to achieve. But with that, I'll uh, pass over to, to Pops. All right, so um, here we go. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. Um, I know we're sh short on time. Uh, I want to tell you that we are at booth E4, so happy to uh, discuss uh, this in greater detail during the day today. I'm also here tomorrow, so uh, we can also look for time uh, later on. But um, just to go on to the, uh, let me know how to do that. Oh, there we go. All right. So I want to talk about the DNA, our DNA that we have, right? I mean, our, as uh, Paul mentioned, we are the only uh, publicly owned 300 millimeter wafer fab, um, and uh, that comes with an incredible uh, process team uh, that I'm proud to be a part of. Uh, but because we are nonprofit, right? I mean, it, is, it is natural for us to value collaborations to focus on our continuing innovation in high advanced technology, but to support the out diffusion of that uh, uh, technology that we develop through the quantum ecosystem, right? So the other main point is that because we are, um, you know, uh, most of the team has got a decade or more each of experience in advanced uh, semiconductor technology fabs, we think that we need to do a our work at a scalable um, uh, level. So we work with advanced tooling, and when we develop the technology, scaling to even higher volume manufacturing fabs is that much easier. And these points are critical, right? We think, just like the semiconductor industry exploded when the PDK mindset was adopted, we want to make sure that we develop a quantum PDK, a superconducting quantum PDK, in partnership with uh, people like Seek and others. And we want to make this PDK open so that you know, we can foster uh, its, uh, its dissemination, its utilization by design uh, engineers across, across the community. The other main point is, rather than looking at each individual piece of the quantum system um, individually and ignoring the nearest neighbor interactions uh, that are important for atoms and they are important for systems as well, we want to make sure that uh, you know, we look at the system holistically, take care of what the interfaces are with the, uh, let's say, uh, the I.O. system. And so for, that is an example of how Seek, for instance, is trying to do that. And um, we, I'll give you other examples of how we are thinking of this at a, uh, at a system level. So just a quick shot about where we started. Back in 2015, we were able to produce the world's first 300 millimeter scale qubits. We use 193 nanometer optical lithography, and thanks to our partnership with Dave Pappas, uh, and also with uh, the Osborne Group in Maryland, we were able to show that the very first qubits we, were, we ever tested had lifetimes, coherence times of 25 microseconds or so. Um, but here we use shadow evaporation. We were doing what everybody else was doing, except we use 193 nanometer lithography for the uh, Dolan Bridge, so that we had a whole wafer level of, uh, uh, of Dolan Bridges and Josephson Junctions and Transmonds to work with. But since then, we have basically taken you know, stock to, to try and do things, re-engineer everything. So now uh, we are working on a process that is full 300 millimeter scale compatible. There is no wafer cleaving into small coupons. Uh, we, as uh, Matt mentioned, we are working with alpha tantalum, we know that the superconducting transition temperature of that is 3.8. We use ALD tantalum nitride as the barrier, tunnel barrier. We confirmed, with seeks help, uh, that it is um, not superconducting down to 8 millikelvin. And this process is our first iteration, if you will, where we were using a ride atop electrode. And since then, we are using advanced processes like chemical mechanical planarization in order to develop um, a uh, sacrificial oxide approach. So when all is said and done, we're back down to no uh, dielectrics with TLS uh, that we have to worry about. But 
we, we are able to achieve very tight control on the dimensions, which we think will translate into control in the uh, qubit frequencies and their uh, performance characteristics. The other thing we are also trying to do is to try and work to shrink the size. So if we're able to develop high Q capacitors that use silicon as the dielectric, imagine you've got, this is work in progress. Um, our first iteration showed yes, we've got uh, you know, uh, tens of attofarads uh, per, per micron uh, capacitance density, but by replacing um, uh, interdigitated capacitors that are at the surface of the silicon with embedded ones, we hope to be able to make higher Q capacitors and replace the resonators that you see with lumped element resonators. And then uh, the other aspect of having uh, high Q capacitors is uh, high kinetic inductance nanowire structures, which we are working to integrate into single photon nanowire detectors for neuromorphic computing, actually, as well as uh, high kinetic inductance uh, elements that could be used in uh, quantum computing uh, hardware. The other thing that we are doing, which is perhaps another example of the system level uh, integration considerations that we're doing is, um, developing aluminum nitride as a, an electro-optic material and a waveguide material that can support a um, you know, UV transparent structure so that we can interface with uh, trapped ion qubits. This is work that is done uh, in partnership with RIT and is supported by AFRL. A lot of our work, I should say, is, uh, is supported by AFRL. We are fortunate to uh, have uh, that partnership. Um, we have some of our first chips are being tested at AFRL, thanks to um, uh, people like Matt LaHaye uh, and um, Jack Lombardi. And so we have shown that, yes, we can pattern aluminum nitride. We can smooth the top surface of the aluminum nitride to unprecedented levels, world-beating levels, and we need to work to figure out um, to uh, address some of the issues. Um, open kimono here, we need to solve a major cracking problem, but we think that is because we were too uh, greedy in terms of the th thickness that we went to, but we should be able to do that uh, in the first months of next year. So I want to take two minutes to say why 300 millimeter qu for quantum and dispel the idea that it is about a uh, number of chips that are coming out of my year, right? It is more about the advanced process capability. You are able to do in-situ process monitors, in-situ process control that are not available in uh, more uh, older generation tools. We operate, in the, the pictures that you saw in Paul Kelly's presentation, in a fab that adheres to all the protocols that you would see in a modern high volume 300 millimeter fab. Uh, what does that mean for us as quantum scientists? It means that it gives us higher signal to noise ratio in the experiments. Less time that you waste in trying to figure out, was this a fluke? Can we reproduce it? And it also allows us to develop that open PDK that I was talking about. Um, and I also talked about the fact that because we have access to MRAM materials and so many, we can integrate multiple technologies on chip to develop that system. This is more of an eye chart to say, you know, we have a variety a slew of materials and here are the magnetic materials uh, and all, all of them. And by developing these technologies in a productive, fa in, a, in a predictable and reproducible fashion, we should be able to support a whole slew of end, end uh, applications that we want to work with in, uh, in partnership with people all over the world. And um, this is a vision for what uh, the uh, sort of operation that um, NY Creates can support in, in the quantum ecosystem. You know, we have a state-of-the-art fab. We are already working with, uh, uh, with other small companies, uh, startups, <coughs> to develop an annex for new materials that are brought into the 300 millimeter fab. We are, as you heard, uh, partnering with, uh, with uh, both uh, companies um, to evaluate new technologies, to develop the PDK. We are working with entrepreneurs. We're working with academics and uh, national labs. I'm fortunate to have relationships with AFRL, with C2QA based in Brookhaven National Lab, as well as uh, NIST. And with that, thank you. I'm sorry I didn't catch the time. I hope I didn't keep you for very long. Thanks so much.